Thank you for tuning in to the Sword and Trial today. Today we have the opportunity of having another conversation with my friend Larry Taunton. Uh, Larry is an author, a speaker. He's the executive director of the Fixed Point Foundation. He's an apologist. He's just done a number of things, traveled around the world. He's a Marx scholar and has written extensively on a variety of subjects. And today we're going to talk to him about the World Economic Forum and what their genesis is and what their agenda is. Larry actually penetrated their meeting at Davos not too long ago and uh, was able to have some interesting conversations. He reports on that as well. So if you uh, have never heard of the World Economic Forum, you especially need to listen to this. If you have and you want to know more about it, I think you will gain some insights from it as well. Welcome to the Sword and Trial. The Sword and Trial is a podcast of Founders Ministries, and Founders exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of local churches. I'm Tom Askell. And I'm Graham Gundon. We're delighted to have you join us on this episode of the Sword and Trial, where we welcome once again Larry Taunton to join us for an important conversation. So, Larry, thank you for coming to us all the way from near Birmingham, Alabama. Great to be with you guys. It's been a while since we've had you on the Sword and Trial, but uh, I've gotten to know you over the last, I don't know, three years, four years or so. Uh, Somehow, you came across my radar in the things that you were writing, and so I went to your website and began to read the posts that you were giving there, uh, writing, putting up there, and man, I was just... uh, uh, very encouraged, ordered some of your books. And I think, I think maybe I reached out to you and said, you don't know me from Adam's house cat, but I would like to know you. And, uh, God just blessed me with your friendship and I'm grateful for all the things you're doing. And especially these last, I don't know, nine months to a year or so, uh, you've just been like a machine putting out very, very helpful information for anybody who wants to understand what's going on in the world, and especially for Christians that want to think rightly about what's going on in the world. So thanks for uh, all of the energy that you are exerting that's benefiting so many people. Well, those feelings are mutual, Tom. I am uh, very appreciative of your work. I'm appreciative of the things that you're doing, of your courage. Um, You reached out to me. I actually remember exactly what it was that caught your eye. It was an article that I published that that went viral just prior to the um, 2020 presidential election. And it was a piece I did titled Marx versus Spurgeon. (laughs) Mm. And uh, that had that had gotten um, your attention. And you're just a brother in arms. And, you know, I'm also encouraged by the fact that our relationship demonstrates the degree to which the gospel is effective. I mean, you're a Texas A&M fan. And, um, <laughs> the fact that I, as an Alabama fan, um, am able to find the grace within me <laughs> to extend grace to you and have fellowship with you, there there absolutely must be a God. That, that, that's true. <laughs> there there has to be a God for an Alabama fan to find grace. So, I, you know, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Yeah, I was uh, telling Larry earlier that, you know, this week they play the University of Texas, and so uh, this week I'll be an Alabama fan. So that's how deeply my <laughs> Texas is. This week only. Th- th- that's I'm right. Gonna, I'm going to have that edited right there, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to cut out this week. I'm just going to put, I'm an Alabama fan. <laughs> just put it on Twitter and, you know, endless loop. Oh, well, Larry, you, uh, you've done a lot. I mean, you're an author, you're an apologist, you've traveled around the world uh, thinking Christianly about different things that take place. Uh, you had a friendship with Christopher Hitchens that led to a book that you wrote about that, and um, uh, just even your experience of reading, I think it was the Gospel of John, with him on a road trip, and uh, you've engaged uh, Muslim uh, imams and talking to them about uh the Christian faith and the Muslim faith. Uh, God's used you in a wonderful way in so many areas. But one of the things recently, and I'd say the last three or four months, you're writing about the World Economic Forum. I think it's opened a lot of eyes to people who weren't even thinking about it, maybe never heard of it before the last year or two. And yet you decided to go on a pilgrimage uh, to actually sit in there at Davos, or Davos, the uh, place where the meeting was taking, uh, being held. And then you recorded some of that in little episodes that you released uh, along the way on social media, and you did a podcast on it. So 
tell us, you've got a whole podcast on what is the economic World Economic Forum, but give us like the 30,000-foot view of the WEF and why not just Christians, but anybody who wants to live free in the world should be concerned. Yes, Tom. Um, I, I did, I started doing a deep dive on the World Economic Forum a couple of years ago. Uh, Daily Wire had asked me to do a series on the World Economic Forum. And uh, so I wrote a four part series for them. Um, don't tell them this, but you can find it on my website at LarryAlexon.com. <laughs> Uh, on their website, it is behind a paywall. <laughs> you, will, you will find it for free on my website. You'll also find uh, my podcast, um, Ideas Have Consequences, mm-hmm. which we have just just launched, and you'll find that on uh, YouTube, in which I discuss this as well. Listen, the World Economic Forum <clears throat> is extremely dangerous, and it's uh, to give a little bit of my pilgrimage, Tom, let's, let's back up about 15 years. We decided at Six Point Foundation, the nonprofit, um, the ministry which I direct, about 15 years ago, um, 16 actually to to be exact, that we were seeing a state of uh, atheistic bestsellers that were hitting the shelves in the wake of 9-11. You know, you had fiction books like Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, which was an assault you know, on the, the Catholic Church and um, Christianity uh, more more broadly. And then you had um, Dan Brown's, excuse me, you had, um, let's see, Daniel Dennett, I've debated him, Daniel Dennett's Breaking the Spell, Sam Harris's Letter to a Christian Nation, Christopher Hitchens, uh, How Religion Poisons Everything, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything, uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, The God Delusion. These were all bestsellers and they were really entering into the consciousness of young people. And so we said, let's take these guys on. Let's take them on in public debates. So we turned um, the focus of our apologetics ministry into taking these guys on directly on the big stage. And to their credit, uh, most of them agreed to take us on. And so you know, if you're familiar with um, Dr. John Lennox, I put John in a, in a few debates. I did a few of these debates. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza, I put him in a few of these debates, and uh, they garnered quite a lot of public attention. But one of the things that I was saying at that time, and this won't be a shock to you, Tom, but I was I was so naive at this point in in the the um, development of Fixed Point Foundation that I really had hoped for, had longed for engagement with and the support of big churches. I, I've i never seen what I do as competitive with churches, but rather that, as I would always say to some of these mega church pastors, listen, you guys are the entree, I'm the garnish on the plate. But allow me to assist you as if you're sitting on the walls, if the church is, you know, is a fortress, you're sitting on the walls looking inward. I'm standing right next to you looking outward and I'm, I'm looking for the next threat that is coming over the hill. Allow me to inform you, allow me to equip your people. And much to my disappointment, most churches, in fact, I'd say the overwhelming majority of churches were very dismissive. You, we don't really need um, you know, anything that you have to offer. Who is John Lennox? Uh, I don't, don't know he, who he is. We're, we're not very interested. Um, and uh, Larry, look, I remember one mega church pastor telling me in, uh, in Birmingham, a nice guy, a, a guy that I, I mean, I genuinely like, but so condescendingly saying to me, Larry, we have 7,000 members. I really don't think we have anything to be aware of it. My response to him was to say, how many of your members came through conversion and how many of them came through um, what I'll call the ecclesiastical arms race of, you know, you build a, you build a nicer, you know, youth facility and church and, and members of church A migrate to church B. Mm-hmm. And I could see his face drop because he knew that the, the majority of the members of his church did not become members through conversion. 
uh, at his church. They had just moved over to his church because they had nicer facilities. They mm. get their oil changed in the parking lot and a Krispy Kreme donut in the, uh, you know, in the, in, 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 in the lobby. So I did not feel that churches were taking this atheistic threat seriously. Well, we continued to track it. We've been following it like like a like a hunter following you know the tracks of a of, of a beast he intends to take down, and we have been following this atheism, which began again with I mean there's really no absolute beginning. I guess it began in the Garden of Eden, but uh, more recently it began on the heels of 9/11, and we we saw it with young people, and then we began seeing it entering into the halls of government, Hollywood popular culture, education, you name it. You began seeing it everywhere, just as we predicted it would. It would start trickling down. Well, that brings me to the World Economic Forum because we're taking on in the World Economic Forum the very same thing that we were seeing in 2006, 2007 with all of these bestsellers, except the thing is now, guys, um, the atheism that we see in the World Economic Forum it's a little different. It's kind of outpaced, left behind guys like Richard Dawkins. Um, Richard, in some ways, it's interesting to me. I continue to have you know dialogue, um, uh, interaction with him, and I think he's a little alarmed in what he's seen taking place, particularly in something like the transgender movement, which he looks at and as a scientist and says, this is ridiculous. It isn't what you feel that you are, it's what your biology you know, says you are. But I always say to Richard, these are your ideological children. Mm. These are individuals who have taken what you taught them, that there is no God, and they have followed it to their logical, to its logical conclusion, to arrive at a place that says, it's anything that goes. If there is no immortality, there can be no virtue and all things are permissible, as Dostoevsky put it. So with the World Economic Forum, we're no longer having the debate over God's existence. Rather, we're dealing with globalists who just simply assume there is no God. They've moved, they've moved the debate on a few notches, and they've arrived at a place where you would expect them to arrive, and that is that human beings have no intrinsic value. They're not they're not made in the image of a creator. They're not endowed with uh, certain unalienable rights among these being life, liberty, and the, they, they don't buy into any of that. They have contempt for humanity. They have contempt for democracy, for the will of the people. And they use language, the words that I keep telling people on my podcast, you must listen for, that behind it, nothing good comes. Uh, because it's freighted with anti-human meaning, and it's phrases like sustainability, um, for the good of the planet, for the common good. Um, nothing good comes after that, and that's because they are fundamentally anti-human. So when I was there in Davos this year, I just pretend it, and they say WEF, by the way, which kind of cracks me up. They don't say <laughs> WEF or World Economic Forum. They say WEF. They say WEF, and they're referred to as WEFers. So I was just <laughs> pretending to be a WEFer. And the result was that it's, you know, it's like me showing up to a meeting of, of David French and Russell Moore and <laughs> Beth Moore and just pretending to be one of the gang. Did you see and them there? <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, you know, quite honestly, it wouldn't surprise me to see them wearing the swag, you oh, know, man. of the, uh, the World Economic Forum. But the point being, people would speak very openly mm. to you about their goals, about their objectives. And they're of the very dangerous type, guys, because they're individuals who are completely possessed. And I use that word quite deliberately. They are possessed, uh, excuse me, of the idea that they are saving humanity, excuse me, mm -hmm. that they're saving the, the planet. I've had a little bit of a cough since I came back from Europe, um, that they're saving the planet. And because they see themselves on, to use John Kerry's words, um, an extraterrestrial mission, not a divine mission, but an mm. extraterrestrial mission. These are people who see themselves as better than you, as exempt from all the rules that they would 
impose on the rest of them. And they talk quite openly of reducing the global population from 8 billion to less than 2 billion. Hmm. Wow. My goodness. So this, uh, what, what's the genesis of WEF? I mean, how did this thing even come into being? Well, you know, it's too bad I don't have here sitting on, on um, it's where I do my podcast from, and I actually just moved it. But um, it comes from the, the, the ideological heritage of this organization. It was founded by Klaus Schwab, you know, the octogenarian German engineer who looks like Donald Pleasance's, you know, version of of uh, Ernst Stavro Blofeld. I mean, I mean, he, you can picture him petting a, a cat, <laughs> you know, and saying, you will own nothing, you will be happy. Um, this is, this is the guy who is the founder, 1971, founder and sole chairman of the World Economic Forum. But quite honestly, I think that his influence is exaggerated um, by critics of the World Economic Forum. I think he's a convenient front man. I think he's more P.T. Barnum than than um, puppeteer. Now, I do believe that there are real puppeteers at the World Economic Forum, but I think they're, they're contented to let Klaus Schwab be the guy who is out front. But uh, where a lot of this came from, um, guys, is during, you know, historically, when you look at what was happening at the time the World Economic Forum was founded, there was about a 10 year period of hysteria over overpopulation. Mm. And a lot of that began with a book that was published in 1968. I mean, this happens throughout Western history from time to time, beginning with the publication of On, Pub, uh, on Population, um, which was published by Thomas Malthus in like, I don't know, 1796 or something. But it, it resurfaced in the 1960s with a book called The Population Bomb um, in 1968 by Paul Ehrlich. Now, that that he's still alive, and he's still out there preaching his same um, evil gospel. But um, his book has been discredited again and again. He had predict predicted in 68 that, that basically within the next decade, we would see a population collapse. We would see populations... Um, billions of people dying from starvation and, you know, because the earth was exceeding its carrying capacity. This was the, this was the argument. And a, uh, a think tank was founded at roughly the same time um, called the Club of Rome. You maybe have heard of the Club of Rome. Now, the Club of Rome is kind of a European version of, let's say, Brookings or Cato, and it's all of these influential academics and businessmen and governmental leaders. And, um, you know, you look at their mission statement, they appear to have a, you know, a, a, a positive mission statement. Their, their idea was that global leaders are too focused on their own political survival and elections and getting reelected and the tyranny of the urgent that they weren't seeing the broader um, global problems. So the Club of Rome said, we will address these issues and sort of advise governments. And they said, we, we urge the founding of a world forum. That's what they called it. Well, in 1971, the world forum was founded by Klaus Schwab and uh, he changed the name eventually to the world economic forum. But you see several things happening at this very time about population. Now what happened in 1973? Well, you had at that time Roe v. Wade, um, <laughs> Again, excuse me, guys. I came back from, I was in Europe last week, and I seemed to have picked something up on the plane. But mm. anyway, um, you have, um, you know, Roe v. Wade was, was deeply influenced by this idea of overpopulation. And then you had National Security Member Memo 200, which is now public information on the United States government website, it was never meant to be, but it is the, the infamous Kissinger report. So Henry Kissinger was writing to Nixon and saying, essentially, we need to reduce the global population by creating a kind of global equivalent of Planned Parenthood. Now, who was a student of Kissinger at the Kennedy, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government? Klaus Schwab. So you begin to see 
the connections here. But the point being, the, the people of this era, the founders of the World Economic Forum, those who had influence on its development, like Paul Ehrlich, like Dennis Meadows of MIT, like Henry Kissinger, like Klaus Schwab, they're all obsessed with population, with global population. We have to reduce it. And so while the World Economic Forum has on its window front all of it, and, and, and if you go, as you know, as I say, as, as, as I did uh, to Davos um, this past year, and I plan to go again and be a fly in their ointment again this next year if I can put the funds together to do it. It's the, 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 they jack up the hotels uh, where, you know, a, a night is maybe $3,000. I'm wow. not kidding. So that it makes it difficult for people like me to go because they buy up these, these other rooms and jack up the prices to try to keep people who are not globalists, you know, from coming. But nonetheless, I think it's very important. And so I intend to try to um, to go again this year because there are things you learn by being there that you just simply cannot learn by watching what is going on on TV. But these are individuals who are absolutely possessed of their own self-importance and their mission is um is is one that they must fulfill over and against the will of the people and so when you're seeing as i'm sure you are western leaders who all of a sudden and just you know the last few years seem to have contempt for their constituencies and don't care what their constituencies think, you know, where they're making decisions where, where the polls say, let's say the people of New York want one thing, but the, the governor or the mayor of the city of New York are doing something that's moving exactly in the opposite direction, where you're seeing Biden doing things that are obviously deeply unpopular, sending billions to Ukraine while people in Maui get $700. It is because this is what they're being advised to do when you read the founding documents of the World Economic Forum, all this stuff is there. It's their playbook. It is their mind comp. Hey, this is Daryl Harrison, co-host of the Just Thinking podcast, and just wanted to let you know that the second in our trilogy of books with Founders Press is fast approaching being available to you. It's called Just Thinking About Ethnicity. Just Thinking About Ethnicities. Pre-orders are available right now at press.founders.org. That's press.founders.org. You can go there right now and pre-order Just Thinking About Ethnicity. The book will ship in January 2024. Just Thinking About Ethnicity. Go to press.founders.org to pre-order today. Well, and, you know, people hear this or hear references to the World Economic Forum. And they say, well, you're just a conspiracy theorist. But none of this stuff has been done in a corner. I mean, th- no, this- hang on one sec. Yeah. Con- conspiracy theorist, let me show you guys. This is an academic paper right here. I just had it sitting here. It is called... The Club of Rome, The Predicament of Mankind. I downloaded this off of the University of Pennsylvania website, you know, and printed it out on my own computer. It's, I don't know, maybe 150 pages, but the relevant parts are about 50 pages. And you see, I have this bad habit, Tom. I actually go and read what these people are saying. I'm not interested in reading what someone else has to say about them. I go straight to the source. This is this is what I, you know, we were doing when I was taking on guys like Dawkins and Hitchens and so forth. I read their books. Mm. You know, have you ever seen that movie Patton? Yes. There's a great line where he's facing, you know, Patton's forces and they're annihilating them. And he says, Rommel, you magnificent something or other. I read your book. <laughs> well, I've read their books. And then they published this. This is called, I don't know if you can see this, it's called The First Global Revolution. This was published in 1991. Again, Club of Rome. This is their, you can get this on Amazon. It doesn't, they didn't publish it as a book. It's an internal, you might think of it as an internal memo. Hmm. John Kerry this past week practically quoted it. Hmm. And that is because 
Listen to this. John Kerry this past week, so a page I have carefully marked. I'm not sure if it's showing up very well there, but it's a page I've carefully marked. So I read through this whole thing to see their playbook. What is it that they're about? John Kerry, who is Biden's appointed climate czar. He is a weffer through and through. John Kerry said in, at a climate conference in Scotland this past week, humanity is the enemy of, excuse me, the, humanity itself is the mm. enemy of man. Boy, when I heard that, you know, my antenna just immediately went up because I went to a page that I had carefully marked in here that says this, Club of Rome, again, an organization that is fundamental in the founding of the World Economic Forum. Listen to this. In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like would fit the bill. In their totality and in their interactions, these phenomena do constitute a common threat which demands the solidarity of all peoples. But in designating them as the enemy, we fall into the trap about which we have already warned, namely mistaking symptoms for causes. All these dangers are caused by human intervention, and it is only through changed attitudes and behavior that they can be overcome because the real enemy is humanity itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as soon as I heard John Kerry say that, I thought, John Kerry's read this. Yeah. I promise you he has read this, and this is the way these people think. So when I hear people telling me, you know, Larry, this is, you know, this is conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theories are by definition secret. I, I tend to agree with Benjamin Franklin, who said three can keep a secret if two are dead. <laughs> the, these are individuals who cannot resist revealing who they really are. They cannot. And so this past week, this, this, the episode on uh, ideas have consequences, our podcast that we dropped on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it yesterday, and on YouTube, this is what we're talking about here because this is all being done in the light of day. Mm. They are that arrogant. They are that arrogant in the same way that had anyone bothered to read Mein Kampf, it's all there. What Hitler planned to do was all right there. And this is their, this is their Mein Kampf. I must tell you, it's not titillating reading. <laughs> it, isn't, it isn't really exciting stuff. But if you want to know who the, uh, they are, that's what you got to read. And you have to be careful because there's a lot of nonsense that's being put out on social media, on Twitter, on X, that says Klaus Schwab said this, or Yuval Noah Harari said that, often things they didn't say, like useless eaters. I keep seeing that a lot. Mm. Um, and, and what happens is they mobilize, you know, Bill, Bill Gates is another weffer. They mobilize their fact checkers who use that as convenient headshots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to, to put that in, in some context, think of it like this. Um, trying to discredit Hitler, say, in the 1930s, um, somebody quotes Hitler as saying, we want to eat all the Jews. And so Joseph Goebbels comes along with a fact check that says, did Hitler say, I want to eat the Jews? No, he didn't say that. Now, the implication of that, of course, would be that somehow he's innocent of any kind of anti-Semitism. Yeah. But the reality is he wants to annihilate all the Jews. And so you keep finding all these little fact checks and we're, you know, we're tracking all these down and demonstrating who's funding them. Mm. Bill Gates is. He is funding through nonprofits, uh, members of media, and people who are doing these fact checks. And it always is designed to make them look good. Did Bill Gates say that he wants to reduce the global population by half? Well, no, he didn't say that. But he wants to reduce the global population <laughs> by more than half. So this, this is what guys like you and I have to do, Tom. I feel very passionate about this, equipping the people on our side to understand this. And I'm prepared to debate anybody on it because I'm here to tell you that this is their literature. 
Mm. And I'm not going and, and looking for the salacious stuff. I'm, I'm using what they're saying, what is coming out of their mouths. And, uh, and, and if you go to the World Economic Forum, you know, maybe maybe you go with me this next time. <laughs> and uh, we just pretend to be a couple of, you know, globalists, a couple of weffers. And you have people walking around wearing silly hats that say things like global citizen and stuff like that. You and I can wear them. That would be kind of fun. <laughs> And then we just go sit as you and I might do if we're sharing the gospel. I just go sit in a coffee shop. There are very few coffee shops in Davos and Davos isn't really suited for a conference of this kind because there are far too many people. It's like having the Southern Baptist convention in Opelika, Alabama. You know, it's just, (laughs) you know, you just can't pull it off. And so the result is that, that hundreds of people pour into a coffee shop and maybe has three tables. So I would get there early and not move. And inevitably, someone would say, um, excuse me, you know, can I sit in one of the chairs at your table? And I'd say, well, why? Yes. I mean, it was it was almost like I was opening the door to Mormons and saying, why? Yes, I would love to talk with you. (laughs) And so they sit at my table, Tom. And I didn't push hard on them because I didn't want to out myself, but I would just simply say things like, so what did you think about the, the WEF agenda to reduce the global population? And these people thinking that I'm one of them would just begin to wax eloquently, but like we're talking batting averages, so it, it, words were never used like kill or annihilate or mass execute. It was always spoken of like we're talking about moving product, hmm. you know, commodities. So people would say things like, um, yes, um, the, the, pop, uh, the global population is not sustainable. We must get to sustainable levels. And you want to interrupt and say, you do realize what you're really talking about is killing billions of people. But see, they, they, they like the Nazis, Mm. like the Nazis, they hide from themselves what they're doing and they use euphemisms. And I was recently, again, just kind of the esoteric stuff that I do. Forgive me. Sometimes I'm a bit of a nerd. I am an Alabama football fan, but (laughs) I occasionally go into things like this. I was reading the minutes of the depositions that preceded the Nuremberg trials. And Tom, fascinating. You come across something where the British and the American interrogators stop one of the prisoners they're talking to and said, you know, you keep using this phrase, final solution. Mm. What does that mean? So, you know, we just accept that everybody always knew what it meant. Mm -hmm. But they didn't always know what it meant. And they came to realize, holy smokes, they're talking about the annihilation of millions of Jews. Mm. And this is what they're doing now, is they Mm. use, watch for those words, sustainability, common good Mm -hmm. there's nothing good for humanity that comes after that nothing thank you for joining us for this conversation today we wanted to remind you of the founders national conference that's coming up next year january 18th through the 20th it's a wonderful time to be here in southwest florida we don't get hurricanes that time of year and it's cold throughout the rest of the country our theme for the conference this year is remember jesus christ so the entire conference will be on the doctrine of christ and dr joel beakey tom askell paul washer conrad and bayway travis allen phil johnson will be our speakers for that conference and we'll also have a special guest ali beth stuckey who will be there to do a live podcast with us as well as a breakout session for the women. So we'd love for you to join us here in Southwest Florida in January for our conference. You can go online and register at founders.org. You know, as you, as you speak to these individuals, I mean, (coughs) proposed solutions for them. I mean, to, to, to meet their, their goals is this um, in terms of uh, sterilizing individuals and in mass uh, populations, or did that ever come out? Vaccinations. <laughs> you mean what is their so? How, how do they plan to do it? Is that yeah. what you're asking? Yeah. Um. You know, they are. You know, I think that their goal is first of all, you can find a 60 Minutes interview with um, Melinda Gates. You know, Bill Gates's ex-wife. 
where she is in Africa and she's talking about, and again, just very excitedly, like she's, you know, she's just won the lottery or, you know, um, she has, you know, really done something really good. These people have a warped moral compass. You see, once you reject belief in God, you just, you just adhere to the prevailing zeitgeist. You're just blown about by the winds. And so here she is talking with this African mother who has, I don't remember, six children or something. And then afterwards, she's talking with the 60 Minutes interview, and she said, see, what we're doing is this mother has had six children or eight children or whatever it is in the hopes that one of them might live to adulthood to take care of her when she's elderly. So she's she's having multiple children in, in the hope that one of them at least will live to be able to take care of her. With the use of vaccines, we will be able to um, reduce population because children will grow up, you know, much more healthy. There, there's something very broken mm-hmm. in, in the way these people, you know, reason. And they're, they're, they're talking as they walk away about how, um, wow, you know, it's crazy. She has eight children. Uh, they, they're anti-human. They don't like children. They don't. And, and that to, to me is, Honestly, you guys could devote a podcast just to this. The war on children in the West is real, and it is all pervasive, and it is it is being led by governments. We're seeing war on children from the highest levels, from the transgender movement to the lopping off of uh, of male genitalia. Uh, this this is honestly this is it, people are using the words like fascist and Nazi. You know, uh, it's just thrown about every day. And usually, you know, towards, say, red staters or Trump supporters, I promise you, the real fascists are on the left. This is fascist Joseph Mengele style stuff that we're dealing with. And I think the way, guys, that we combat them, I want to take them on in public forums. I want to go at them. I don't want to just throw red meat to my side. I want to I want to inform my side. But it's interesting, a friend of mine who was a producer at NPR, he uh, reached out to me about a year ago, a good guy, guy that I've known for many years. And he said, hey, you know, um, all things considered, would like to begin having a conservative voice on the show. Um, would you consider that? And I said, I'll just say his name's Phil. I said, Phil, with relish, I would love to be your guy. But if you think that NPR is going to choose me, <laughs> there's zero chance of that. They're going to want a David French type, somebody who, you know, is a a a uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing, somebody who pretends to be a conservative, but who in fact is not, and someone they can leverage against real conservatives they'll they'll recognize right away that i am a real conservative and that i can't wait to go at it with them that isn't going to be what they want and so finding those venues and those opportunities to go after these people is very very difficult but i am convinced that from our pulpits as much as possible we have to be waking people up Mm. to what this is and help them to see the relevance of scripture which addresses this with the broader culture. We are not preparing apologists. It, 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 is, it is an embarrassment what is happening in our seminaries recently speaking in a, uh, to a group of students at a prominent university who are all in apologetics courses. And it became a shouting match between me and their professor because their professor did not like me referring to abortion talking about abortion. And he began talking instead about um, how lynching of black people was a major problem in America. And I just happened to have been researching that issue. And I said, you know, the last black man to be lynched in America was in 1981, happened in the state of Alabama. And that man went to the electric chair. I said, don't think that's a huge problem, but we do have millions of children who are being annihilated Um, through abortion. And my final words to him as he was shutting down my lecture is, sir, you're not producing ministers of the gospel. You're producing social justice warriors, and they are not the same thing. Mm. And 
and that's at a so-called conservative institution. Yeah. Um, we are preparing our side. We're doing a lousy job of doing it. This is fascinating, Larry. This is uh, exactly the kind of thing that we need to get up to speed on, and we want to encourage people to follow you. Uh, go to LarryAlexTaunton.com to get all of the information that you've uploaded there, not behind a paywall. Mm-hmm. And your podcast, Ideas Have Consequences, is worth uh, subscribing to. We encourage folks to do that as well. And, you know, I've been thinking for a while, I think I may have floated the idea by you early on, but this has just rekindled it in my mind. I'd love to talk to you further uh, offline here about um, setting something up where we could host a forum like that and uh, address these issues, bring the best from the other side to make their case and provide an opportunity for there to be an open debate, dialogue about these things from a Christian worldview, if you would be willing to do that, and whoever the other side would want to set forward. So uh, let's consider that. I'd be very interested, Tom. Listen, um, I, I, I'm, I'm very passionate, as you can see, on this issue because I'm alarmed and because it's my calling. Mm-hmm. This is my calling. Um, I am, in a sense, um, you know, a, a, a gladiator that the Lord has, has called into this work. And I don't rely on my own cleverness or, you know, how witty or smart Larry Taunton is. Um, I pray and cling very close to the cross that the Lord will give me wisdom, that he'll give me understanding because there's so much here, Tom, that quite frankly, I feel like I still am grappling with understanding, but I, but I had, I had this very good fortune and I, a rather blessing. And I, I, I want to leave this with your listeners because it just goes to show you the way the Lord prepares us. Uh, and I think you know this, but it, it maybe bears repeating for your listeners. In the 1990s, in the early 1990s, I was a student of Russian history, of Marxism, um, of European history. And um, here I am heading to graduate school when the Soviet Union collapses. I am literally boarding a plane to head to Europe uh, to study, continue my studies in Russian and European history, intellectual history, Marxism, socialism, these ideas, and um, at the graduate level. And my advisor tells me, uh, very well-intentioned, Larry, go to law school. Uh, Your your talents will be better used there because Marxism is now on the quote ash heap of history. Um, there are now um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of experts in these issues who do not have jobs. And it is because Marxism is dead. This issue is dead. We have all these people with expertise in a subject. It's like having you know, um, uh, you know, computer skills that they'll deal with cobalt language. It's, it's dead. It's lost. There's no future in this. And for reasons that I can't fully explain, I just felt that I needed to continue my study and I kept moving in this direction. And I have to tell you, Tom, for a very long time, it felt like I had been very unwise to ignore my counselor because my advisor, because it felt like there was no future in what I was doing. And I finished graduate school and there wasn't a great deal of interest in somebody who taught and addressed the kind of subjects that I addressed. And then as my life, you know, began to move on and particularly in the last decade and in watching these issues reemerge, I realized the Lord had prepared me for a time such as this, that I was getting, I was acquiring skill in something that I thought was a complete waste and would help me on watching Jeopardy at home on the couch, but wasn't going to be useful in any real meaningful sense to advance the kingdom. And uh, when I wrote The Grace Effect in 2011, which is telling the story of our daughter, adopted daughter, Sasha, but is more broadly telling the story of Marxism and socialism, the Lord began using that book in a big way. And it was because I was realizing all of those things that I was seeing and was was learning about in the 90s are now re-emerging among young people. And here we are, that was in 2011, and now the issues have, have advanced well beyond that. Unfortunately, we do not have very many Christians 
who are equipped to recognize and address these issues. Mm -hmm. And that absolutely must change. I feel like we are preparing students and even a lot of the apologetic students that I engage there, and you will know exactly what I'm talking about. They're, they're very young and filled with confidence overflowing to arrogance because they've never actually encountered an enemy. They just have made A's on their essays or, you know, in class they can see very, very, seem very clever, but they've never actually engaged people who hold that worldview. And I'm just telling you, the other side is equipping people to infiltrate churches. You know this better than I do. Mm -hmm. You know what's happening in the SPC. They are preparing their own apologists to dismantle the Christian faith in the West. We have been doing donuts on the lawn and not preparing our side. And I feel absolutely passionate about raising up a generation of young people, young men in particular, who are not afraid to be canceled on social media, who are not afraid to be called names, who are not afraid to engage with the truth, and who, when they get bruised, they get back up and they go at it again. That's what has to change. Amen. Well, that's exactly what we need, and we're so grateful for your engagement in that and promoting that. And appreciate you joining us today and talking about these important matters. Again, we encourage you to go check out Ideas Have Consequences, that uh, podcast. If you're not following it, start doing that. And uh, LarryAlexTaunton.com. You can also follow you on X or Twitter at Larry Taunton. Is that right? It's just your name. Is that correct? Yes, that's okay. right. LarryAlexTaunton.com. And you know, it's very unfortunate. Uh, Tom, I'll tell you this. There is a Larry Taunton who was a Democrat congressman who was a very good friend of Bill Clinton. <laughs> never want to be confused with that Larry Taunton. All right. We will make sure that we link to all of these things. So <laughs> it's that a you very don't... <laughs> important middle name. <laughs> That's right. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Larry, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you for tuning in to The Sword and the Trial. We are grateful for the opportunity to uh, provide these kinds of conversations for you and especially want to thank our Founders Alliance members for their support of this ministry. If we can do anything to serve you here at Founders, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Why are we here? What is the most important thing in the world? One of our greatest problems is, is forgetting. We, we forget what God has done for us. We forget what God has taught us. We forget things that we have experienced. If we don't pause, if we don't think deeply, if we aren't reminded again and again and again, we forget. It strikes me pretty significantly in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, remember Jesus Christ. Why in the world? Would Paul tell a pastor to remember Christ? Well, he's not going to forget that Jesus Christ lived and that Jesus Christ taught, but he's going to forget the significance of Christ. Christ is ultimately our mission. The church is the body of Christ. A church has to focus on the supremacy of Christ because that's why we are the church. Christ is supreme overall. The church is great mission is to preach Christ. We're there to win souls. We're there to advance Christ's kingdom. The problem with the world is not that they don't agree with me. The problem is that they don't bow the knee to Christ. So that's why we're going to gather to specifically, explicitly focus on the supremacy of Christ, to do our best to remind each other of the centrality of Christ, the beauty of Christ, the glory of Christ. So join us in Fort Myers, Florida, January 18th through 20th, 2024, as we focus on Jesus Christ. I hope to see you there.